I took a whole year of quantum mechanics in graduate school and it was really um, complex. Here, we're not going to go through that whole thing. What we're going to be taking a look at is understanding what quantum mechanics is and how it's relevant in terms of the model of the electron. So let me go ahead and get started. Um, if you guys uh, don't have any questions and I don't see anything in the um, chat panel. So remember the history of the atom? They figured out that the Greek model of the atom was all bogus and that there, during the enlightenment years between like 1500 and about uh, late 1800, they, dis they started to have more scientific in inquiry and they found out that matter wasn't made out of earth, wind, fire, and um, water, that it had a discrete amount and that discrete amount they called atoms and it had particles in them. And they started to put the particles together and they found out that the negative charge particle was the electron, that the atom consists of the nucleus and the nucleus contains the protons and the neutrons. The proton is required for an atom. The hydrogen atom has one proton, no neutrons. So neutrons are not necessary, but as you get to more complicated atoms, the neutrons go in there. And the neutrons are thought to stabilize. The fact that if you put all these positive charges in the nucleus, then they would be repelled by each other because positive and positive, it's like putting North Pole, two North Poles on a magnet together and they would basically repel each other. So the neutrons are in there to kind of stabilize things. Anyway, they figured out what, what uh, the parts of the atoms are and then they started to figure out what the structure is. And um, Bohr came up with the atomic model of the atom and that worked in terms of some of the scientific evidence and the scientific data, but it started breaking down as soon as you had more than two electrons. So Schrodinger came in and said that you can't really treat electrons as particle. You have to treat it as an energy pack. <clears throat> and as an energy pack, it has waves. And so that's where we stand in terms of the Schrodinger equation. Okay. Um, in the development of the Schrodinger equation, quantum mechanics grew. And in quantum mechanics, um, as you start to investigate the model, the atom in details, you find out that in order to put a mathematical function on the atoms, you had to have something called quantum numbers. And this is just, this page is just a review of quantum numbers. And here, is what we call the principal quantum number. And the principal quantum number, if you want to take a visual, is basically the shells of an atom. Okay, if this is the nucleus, then the shell of the atom is represented by the principal quantum number. The first shell, n equals one. The sh second shell, n equals two. The third shell, n equals three. And for an atom, you actually have n equals infinity. There are actually infinite number of shells for an atom, okay? Then within each shell, you have something called orbitals. That's the azimuthal quantum number, and it's represented by the letter L. And I'll talk more about that, but L takes on the value of uh, zero all the way to n minus one. So depending on which shell you are, the L values are going to be restricted based on that. So if you're in the third shell, for example, N equals three, then your L value is going to be zero, one, and two, okay? So that's, that's your L value for the third shell. For the fourth shell, your L value is zero, one, two, and three. So that's basically what the azimuthal, it has to do with angular momentum. The third quantum number is electron spin, or um, sorry, not electron spin, orbital orientation. And that means that each orbital can be orientated in 3D space. And that's represented by the orbital orientation quantum number, M sub L. 
and we'll talk more about that shortly. And then finally, we have the electron spin. Electrons can spin either up, and we represent that with a arrow pointing up or spin down. So if you think of an electron, again, I'm doing injustice to an electron. Yes, this is chapter nine. Um, if we're doing, if we are, um, there was a question on chapter nine, we covered um, the beginning of chapter nine last week. So this is the, the body of chapter nine. Uh, if you think of electron as, again, we're doing injustice in terms of the electron because we're thinking of it as a particle. But yet, if you want to visualize it, you have to think about it in terms of some sort of, um, we have to think about it as a wave, but to visualize it, we have to think about it in terms of a particle. And this electron can either pick uh, spin clockwise, we represent that by an up arrow, or it can spin counterclockwise, and we represent that by a downward arrow. And because two electrons can fit one orbital, two electrons cannot have the same spin, otherwise they will repel each other. That's why we have the electron spin quantum number. So. That's what we will talk about in terms of quantum mechanic. Then we'll talk about exactly how these quantum mechanic numbers um, sort of fill the picture in terms of the, of the electron configuration. Okay, so, so that's where we're going with this right here. So this is, this is Erwin Schrodinger, and this is the equation he proposed. It looks like a very simple equation. It's called the Hamiltonian, and it's um, it's called that way because of this Hamiltonian operator. A Hamiltonian operator is like any wave function or any math function. If you take the square root of a number x, then you know what to do with that number in order to get its value. For example, if you have something like 16, then what times what by itself equals 16? You say that that value is four. Well, in a much more sophisticated math, that's what the Hamiltonian does. The Hamiltonian takes a, is a function that works that on this wave, um, this probability function, this wave function, and it spits out the energy of that and it gives you back the wave function. So the main thing about the uh, Schrodinger equation is that if you apply the Schrodinger function to uh, a wave function, and that would be like an atom, then what you would get out is the energies of that atom and the wave function back, okay? Don't try to uh, make sense of this other than the fact that it's a mathematical equation that gives you quantum numbers. So the, the wave function psi, this is the Greek, Greek letter psi, is the wave function and it has wave properties. Remember what a wave is. A wave is one that has an amplitude and a, and a cycle, okay? So the, the um, energetics of the um, atom, the electrons in the atom is described by this wave function. But the interesting thing is that if you square that wave function, then you have something called the probability distribution. The probability probability distribution tells you where you can where these electrons are located somewhere in the atom. Okay, so again, um, it's somewhat abstract, but what you want to get out from this discussion is the fact that we have we're describing now the atom or the electrons in the atom in terms of wave. And we want to describe how the electrons are, are the structure of the electrons in these atoms. So what is the significance of the Schrodinger equation? Well, the properties of the Schrodinger equation is mathematically sophisticated, but it has four important features that can be appreciated without understanding how to solve it. And these four features I already mentioned, 
the principal quantum number, azimuthal, the orientation, and the magnetic spin. Those are the solutions for these wave functions for an electron in an atom. The Hamiltonian is different for every atom or ion. So because the wave functions are different than the Hamiltonian, that H psi equals E psi is going to be different. Okay, the wave function has wave properties and spatial properties. Spatial properties tells you how they're orientated in a Cartesian coordinate, x, y, and z. Okay, so it gives you a visual of how the electrons are uh, sitting around the nucleus. The wave psi is a mathematical function that gives information of the electron at any point in space, shells, and orbital. Psi squared is the probability of finding the electron at any point in space. We'll see a picture of this shortly. Schrodinger equation has solutions only for specific values. This is called the quantum condition. That's why when I drew a model of the atom, I showed the shells because the electrons can only be found in these shells. They can't be found in between. That's what we call the quantum condition. And then finally, the Schrodinger equation has solutions for any atom, molecule, and molecule, and has an infinite number of solutions. Molecules or atoms have infinite numbers of discrete energies, and each of these corresponds to different wave function. So that's a handful, but this is a good summary of what we're talking about when we talk about the Schrodinger equation in relation to quantum mechanics. Okay, so this is a again a simplistic picture. This is a, my attempt of a model of an atom and the electrons. Let's say this is the hydrogen atom. The electrons is in a ground state and that's depicted by this purple line right here. Okay, when it gets excited, the electron jumps to a higher excited state. In the ground state, it has a wave function. It has a probability of being found somewhere in the ground state, and then that, that electron has a certain amount of energy. When it gets promoted to the excited state, now it has a new wave function. It has a new probability of being somewhere in that higher excited state, and then that electron has an energy that you can, you can calculate. So that's why it has infinite solutions, because remember what I said, that an atom has infinite number of shells, n equals infinity. So the electron can be promoted to the uh, 138th shell or the 1026th shell. Um, and the shells are not, the dif distance between one shell and the other is not the same. It actually gets smaller the further out you go, okay? Um, so this is just my attempt to kind of show you, again, in a visual terms, how the Schrodinger equation tries to describe these things. It is essential to realize that atomic orbitals bear no resemblance whatsoever to orbitals in the Bohr model. The orbital is a mathematical, this is important, function with no independent physical reality. So even though we're trying to make you understand what's going on in the nitty gritty, and that's probably why quantum mechanics can be uh, very confusing, and only those who can really understand the very, very abstract really appreciates it. But uh, in the nitty gritty, there are no independent physical reality. Okay, if you become one, become a theoretical physicist or a theoretical chemist, then you will appreciate this. So here is a represented representation of the orbitals. Remember the orbitals are the shells around the nucleus. So this is the nucleus and these are the shell. This is Bohr's model. This is Bohr's model. Basically you have the nucleus and like the planetary system, the electrons are going to be found in certain discrete orbitals. This is a 3D depiction. You can think of a 3D depiction best like an onion. If you take an onion and you slice it up, you'll find out it has layers and layers and layers. 
okay so that's what we can think of as an individual atom is that it's got layers and layers and layers of these orbitals and um, the lowest ones are filled with electrons okay and this is the probability distribution the probability distribution shows you how likely or where likely the electrons are found and we represent it by psi the wave fun function and then psi squared the probability of finding that electron in 3d space okay so again we're, we're we we are not looking at a physical picture we're looking at the probability of where the electrons are found i guess the best analogy to this is like if you had a room an empty room and there's a light bulb that's hanging from the ceiling and you have a firefly in there okay and of course insects flies are attracted to the light and you have a camera that takes a picture of the room so we have a room we have a light bulb and then you have a camera that takes a picture of what's going on okay so what happens is that the camera will take a snapshot like maybe every two seconds or three seconds what the camera will will see is that the fly is very close to that light bulb at any point in time but it can also be found outside here and so what you have is not a event in which you can you can um, follow the path of the firefly but you're seeing where the firefly was at at any point in time and so that's exactly what we have in terms of that probability distribution what you have is a density diagram that shows where the likely location of that electron is but if you try to find the electron at that location you find out that it's not there um, because it's somewhere else that's what we call the heisenberg uncertainty principle what you can only do is give a probability of how likely that electron will be in that space okay so again um, trying to make sense of a very abstract concept based on your what you guys understand here is a more sophisticated diagram of the wave function and how we represent the probability of finding the electron this right here is the first shell this is the 1s the 1s and you guys will know this is the first shell it has an n equals one and the orbitals are going to be the s shell the s shell is spherical and what you see in terms of the um what you see in terms of the wave function is that the wave function tells you this type of um this type of illustration and this is this is really not as important as this because this tells you the probability diagram and if you take a look at the probability di diagram what you find out is that the electron is actually going to have the greatest po probability that is the electron in the first shell it has the greatest probability of being in the nucleus of the atom so this is the nucleus where the protons and the neutrons are that first electron in that shell it has a probability of being in there kind of weird but that's basically what it's telling you the probability of the electron being in the nucleus is high and then in the second shell you have a probability of the electron in the nucleus as well as some some distance out here okay that's the atomic radius that's the atomic radius and then in the third shell it has a probability of being in the nucleus some some distance out and then another distance out here so these these heavy shading represent where the the highest probability of finding these electrons and these heavy shading represents these particular humps in this function right here 
this is high probability of finding the electron here, here, and here for, for the electron in the third shell. So let's go back to the quantum numbers. Again, N is the shell. L is the subshell. So L represents the subshell. When N equals 1, L can only be 0 because L takes on the value of N minus 1. And L equals 0 is the S orbital. When N equals 2, L can be 0 and 1. And that's the S orbital and the P orbital. So that's what we see right here. Okay, that's what we see right here. For an L value of zero, then we have a magnetic quantum number of only M sub L equals zero. When L equals one, then we have a magnetic quantum number of minus one, zero, and plus one. The magnetic quantum number can be minus L through zero to plus L. And again, these are just values, quantum numbers, that gives you information about the electron. And then finally, we have your magnetic spin quantum numbers. The spin can either be spin up, in which is positive, one half, or spin down, which is negative, one half. And one orientation isn't more likely than the other. It's sort of random. It's like heads and tails on a coin. Okay? So keep these in mind because I'm going to try and make it easier for you to remember in the next slide. But these are the quantum number that comes out of the Schrodinger equation. So again, here are the values. N equals 1. You only get L equals 0 and M sub L equals 0. So Again, this, these are the quantum conditions. That is, there's discrete amount. So for n equals 1, first shell, you only have the s orbital. On the second shell, you have an s orbital and a p orbital. And in the p orbital, there's three types. Minus l, sorry, not minus l, minus 1. Because L, L can be equal to 1, so it's minus 1, 0, and plus 1. And this represents Px, Py, and Pz. Okay, that's what um, L equals 1 is. Minus 1, 0, and plus 1, and that represents Px, Py, and Pz. When L equals, when L equals 2, and this is not, three, this is two, okay? I copied this from um, a book that was wrong. When L equals two, then the problem, what the um, quantum numbers are is M sub L values is minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two. And these represents DXY, DXZ, DYZ, dz squared and dx squared minus y squared. These are the orbitals. It gets more complicated from there, so I'm going to stop there. Okay. So remember I said that each electron in an atom has a unique um, have wave function, and each electron is unique in the atoms. No two electrons can be identical. And so if you think about something that you can relate to, you can think about you and I. You and I are unique in this planet, in this universe. Um, if you want to think about how we're going to locate you or how you're going to locate me, I have a name that's unique. And yes, other people might have that name. But what makes me different is my sh where I live, the street address, the city that I live in, my state, and my zip code. You can think about that in terms of the electrons in the atom. Each electron in an atom has their own unique address, and those unique address are 
the quantum numbers. Yes, this exactly ties into electronic configuration. All these that I'm trying to build up for, on you, uh, you'll see exactly how it fits into electrons configuration, okay? But I have to build up the story first. And when you get to Chem 200, or you take a test that uh, requires general chemistry knowledge, they're going to quiz you on your understanding of the Schrodinger equation, because that's a basic fundamental of um, concepts in general chemistry. So as I was saying, um, each of us have a unique address. Each electron in an atom has a unique address. And those, and the address are the quantum numbers, the principal quantum number, that tells you where the electrons are found in which shell. It tells you the azimuth quantum number. It tells you the orbitals, an S, a P, or a D, or an F orbital. It tells you their orientation. It tells you if it's a PX, a PY, or a PZ. And then the magnetic spin quantum number, whether the electron is spin up or spin down. So if you take any electron in an atom, you can actually come up with all these values, these unique values for each electron in an atom. And if you take another electron in that same atom, these values are not going to be identical, okay? They're not going to be identical. They have unique address. So, and I'm going to try again. I've been building up the concept so that you guys can see how these, these abstract concepts fit into the picture that we paint. Here again are the values for the address code, principal quantum number, the azimuthal quantum number, that's the shape, that's the shape. The, um, sub, the orientation quantum number right here, okay, M sub L, and then the magnetic spin quantum numbers. These are the values. So let's take a look at the principal quantum number. The principal quantum number just tells you the shell. And if you take a look at an atom and think about it in terms of an onion, then we have n equals one is the closest to the nucleus. n equals two is the next concentric sphere out there. n equals three and n equals four. So that's pretty easy. Each atom are going to be found in a shell. Okay, this actually is going to be size squared. So let's move on. This is the azimuthal quantum number. We've had N, now we're looking at the azimuthal. The azimuthal, I told you, was the shape of the orbitals. And these things take on values from zero all the way to N minus one. So if N equals three, then the value for L is zero, one, and two. L equals zero tells you the shape is spherical. L equals one tells you the shape is P shape. It looks like a dumb, dumbbell. L equals two tells you the shape is a D type. L equals three, the shape is an F type. So let me erase that. And this is what they look like. This is your S orbital. Oops. This is your S orbital, it's spherical. This is your P orbital. It looks like a dumbbell or figure eight or infinity. This is your D orbital. It looks like a four leaf clover. This is your F orbital. It's a lot more complicated. And these nodes, these are called nodes. This is the probability of finding the electrons in somewhere in space in these orbitals. The probability of finding an electron somewhere in space, if this is the nucleus, is somewhere here and somewhere here. For an S, it's spherical. For a D, it's somewhere here, 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 or here, but not here. These are called, sorry, let me take my, these are called lobes. These are called lobes. Probability of finding the electron somewhere in space, those are called lobes. And the probability of not finding an electron somewhere in space are called nodes. 
there's a node there there's a node here there's a node there because you can't find the electrons in that space that's not the probability um, function so we're looking at lobes and nodes okay and um, here's the magnetic quantum number remember that when n equals 1 l equals 0 that's an s orbital and m sub l, s equal m sub l m sub l equals 0 when n equals 2 l can be 0 and 1 it can be 0 and 1 and the m sub l could be minus 1 0 and 1 px py pz which one i call px py pz doesn't really matter because you could orientate this in space when n equals 3 we have l equals 0 1 and 2 l equals 0 is s orbital l equals 1 is the p orbital l equals 2 is the d orbital so in that third shell you not only have an S, a P, but also a D. L equals three. Well, you now have F orbitals. There are seven types. These have five types. These have three types. And this only have one. One, one, two, three. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, there should be a positive three there. If you ever take a look at the periodic table, what you find out is that these are very related to the periodic table. And I hope to make that clear when we get to electron configuration and the periodic table. So this was your magnetic quantum number, M sub L, okay? Your M sub S is your magnetic spin. And it was very difficult to find that particular evidence of that quantum number. But if you take a look at the atomic line spectrum for an atom, what you see is not one line for like the hydrogen atom, which you find upon closer detail is two very, very close lines. And those two very, very close lines represent an electron sitting in an orbital with an orientation up and an orientation down. They have slightly different energies. So that is represented by the magnetic spin quantum number. Because remember what I said, no two electrons in an atom have the same set of quantum numbers. So let's take a look at how this is all put together. In our first shell, we have, if we think about our first shell, we can only have the s orbital. This is your n value. This is your l value. n equals 1, l equals 0, s orbital. In your second shell, you can have n equals 2. L could be equal to zero, in which case there's an S orbital, or L equals one, in which case there are P orbitals. And what you have is three types of P orbitals. They look like this, okay? On the third shell, you have um, not only the N equals three, you not only have the S orbital, and the p orbital but you also have the d orbitals right here these are the d orbitals and these are what it looks like this is your s this is your p this is your d we're not even going to try the f because it really gets more complicated than that so this is the wave function look at the lobes look at the nodes The lobes are the highest probability of finding the electron. 
the nodes are zero probability of finding the electrons. Lobes and no nodes, okay? So if you take a look at this right here, what you have is the 1s. We're looking only at the s orbital for any n value, n equals one, two, and three. And this is the probability function of what it looks like. So in the first shell, you have this. Second shell, you have this. Third shell, you have this. These are your s orbitals in the different shells. If you overlap them, this is what they look like. When you overlap them, this is your n, n equals one, this right here is your n equals two, this right here is n equals three. And look at how the nodes all overlap each other. And the nodes also overlap each other. This right here is your p. So if you have, if this is what the s orbital looks like spherical, this is what your p orbitals look like, okay? This is your p orbital. Again, your p orbital is going to look like a figure eight or an infinity. So it has zero probability of being in the center. Zero probability of being in the center. High probability of being somewhere in space. So if this is your distance from the nucleus, if this is the nucleus right here, and this is your distance from the nu nucleus, what you have is a high probability of finding that p orbital somewhere out there, but zero probability of finding it in the nucleus. This is your d um, probability function. Again, if you look at your d probability function, it'll look like this. This is only one of them. It has zero probability of being found in the center, high probability of finding somewhere some distance out here, okay? So again, we're trying to give you abstract concepts in a simplified picture. So let's put it all together. And I hope this is where you see how all of these comes together. These are the different shells. N equals one, N equals two, N equals three, N equals four. N equals one, N equals two, N equals three, N equals four. In the first shell, you only have an s orbital. That's the only thing you can find. In the second shell, this shell right here, you can find an s orbital and a p orbital. And remember the p orbitals, there are three types. So in here is a very complicated picture of s and p. It's, live, it's in that shell. And there's only two types. L equals zero and L equals one. L equals zero is the S, L equals one is the P. On the third shell, we have three types. L it could be zero, one, or two. L equals zero is the S, L equals one is the P, and L equals two is the D. So in this third shell, and notice how it's further out, you have all these probability function of where those electrons are. On the fourth shell, you have L equals zero, L equals one, L equals two, L equals three. And these are found in the fourth shell, okay? So hopefully this picture sort of puts a little bit more of a concrete picture of what's going on in the atom. You have these concentric spheres. These are called your principal quantum number. Within each sphere, you have different types of comp complexity. Your first is the most simple. Your second has a more complicated picture. You've got an S and a P. Your third has an S, a P, and a D. Your fourth has an S, a P, a D, and an F. Okay. So, if you think about the energies, and each of these electrons have a certain energies involved, and the energy goes up this way. The, the stabilist electrons are going to be found near the nucleus. As you go further out from the nucleus, they become more energetic, okay? So 
uh, this is what's going on in terms of this complicated diagram. This is your first shell. And look, you can put one electron there. And that would be the hydrogen atom. The hydrogen atom has an electron configuration of 1s1. And that shows that the, that electron's in the first shell in the s orbital. And then when you put two electrons in, you're putting it in the first shell. That would be your helium atom. And that helium atom has an electron configuration of 1s2. And this 2, we have 1s here, could be electron spinning up or electron spinning down. Okay, that's why I have these arrows. When we have lithium, then we have three electrons. The first two electrons are in the first shell. The next electron is in the um, second shell. And this is what it looks like. I got to erase this real quick. This is your lithium. Lithium is 1s2, 2s2, 2s1. If we do a box diagram, it looks like this. Okay. So do you see how these quantum, these electrons all have unique quantum numbers? The quantum number for this particular electron is n equals 2. L equals zero and M sub L equals zero. That's going to be different from these guys right here because that's N equals one, L equals zero, M sub L equals zero. And then for one of them, M sub S equals positive one half, M sub S equals negative one half. So that's basically the fact that we have the, um, that, that each electron has a unique set of quantum numbers. So let me go ahead and erase that. And again, I hope these things are coming to light. And I hope that the, the buildup that we had now makes sense in terms of the electron configuration. Okay. This is a summary of what we just talked about. This is a summary of, of the wave function. The next slide will show you how it all comes together. So I'm going to leave this here, and then I'll, I'll start with the next one, um, okay, because we still have about 45 minutes. And hopefully in this next slide, the buildup that we did in this particular section will come to light as we start developing the architectural model of the atom.